I'm Leslie. And I'm Steph. And this is Church Historia. You are listening to Church Historia. This is Leslie. And this is Stephanie. And this is the second to last episode of season two. And we are talking about Britain and Ireland and all the things that happened there. So Steph, give us a brief sort of idea of what we're going to be doing. Yeah, so Christianity develops a little bit differently in Britain and Ireland um, than it does on the continent. So last episode, we spent a lot of time in continental Europe with Charlemagne. And so this time, we're going to focus a little bit more on the islands mm-hmm. to the northwest and look at how Christianity grows there and is shaped there. And then we're going to uh, find a, a nice little through thread that will connect us back with Charlemagne from the last episode. Mm. So we're really excited that you are joining us as we as always get to our second to last episode of the season. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with us. Episode five. Christianity comes to Britain and Ireland. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to hear what you're going to say because you know a lot about this subject. <laughs> I do. This is sort of my, my personal area of uh, interest, although, interestingly, I tend to focus a little bit later uh, mm. mm-hmm. in development. So this was this was fun for me to go back and re-remind myself of this history. Christianity comes to Britain and Ireland in a slightly different way and style than it does the rest of the continent that we talked about last episode. And so I specifically wanted to call these two out, and one of the main reasons why Christianity coming to these areas is different is that they're both islands. Mm. So Ireland in particular is never conquered by Rome. They're aware of Rome and they have some awareness and, and interchange with Rome, but they're never conquered by Rome. And Britain has a Roman presence, but it's kind of tenuous mm. at best and it's not very long lasting. So I thought we'd start with England, and we will be relying a lot on the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede. So he is an English medieval historian, and he puts together this history of Christianity in in England. And so he is one of our main sources for how this went. So we will be hearing from him a lot this episode. So according to him, in 156, there's a British king whose name is... Lucius, who writes to the Pope and asks to become a Christian. Hmm. So that, that seems to suggest that from fairly early on, from 156, there are some Christians in Britain. Mm-hmm. Probably not a ton. There's not really a mass movement, but there, there are some. We have the arrival of the Saxons in the 5th century in Britain, and that tends to kind of swings back whatever movement towards Christianity there had been. The Saxons come back in, things swing back towards the kind of paganism of the Saxons and and the Britons. So in 596, Pope Gregory I sends a group of missionaries to England led by a gentleman named Augustine. This is not Augustine of Hippo. Uh This is a different Augustine. Not the... This is not the Augustine, this Uh is an Augustine, ultimately of Canterbury, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Okay. So he's been made bishop, and he sets off with a bunch of other men, and they are making their way to England. And Bede tells us that they became afraid and began to consider returning home, for they were appalled at the idea of going to a barbarous, fierce, and pagan nation of whose very language they were ignorant. So they essentially get to the coast in probably France, and they're like, no, we really really want to go home. So they send Augustine back to the Pope to be like, hey, can, can we come home? And Gregory says, no, you need to proceed on. Christ will give you strength. So they steal themselves and they arrive in Britain. Then we have this kind of lovely story about their interactions with King Ethelbert. Um, Good name. Great name. Ethelbert. Yep. So they arrive in what is modern day Kent and they end up meeting with Ethelbert outside be- and because he's not quite sure what to make of these newcomers and how he feels about them. And so he he does agree to meet with them, but again, kind of outside. And they 
apparently have with them silver cross and a panel painted with the image of Christ. And I don't know if they're parading it or what exactly they're doing, but Ethelbert's kind of intrigued. And so he allows them to preach to himself and the, the people gathered there. And then after they're done preaching, this is what he says to them according to Bede. He says, your words and promises are fair indeed, but they are new and uncertain. I cannot accept them and abandon the age-old beliefs that I have held together with the whole English nation. But since you've traveled far, and I can see you are sincere in your desire to impart to us what you believe to be true and excellent, we will not harm you. We will receive you hospitably and take care to supply you with all your needs, nor will we forbid you to preach and win any people you can to your religion. So it's very all things welcoming. considered, yeah, it's, sure. it's fairly welcoming and open-handed. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, I've got, I've got some respect for, for Ethelbert, who's not willing to just forsake everything he's known and believed yeah. because some guys showed up on the coast with a silver cross and a painting. Mm -hmm. But he gives them some land in Canterbury, mm -hmm. and ultimately they establish a monastery there and a presence there. Okay. And that's why Canterbury today in England has a, a special place within religious oh, history. And yeah. you talk about the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. um, being centered out of there with Augustine being the first okay. Bishop of Canterbury. That makes sense. So Ethelbert was most likely accompanied in this interaction with his wife, Queen Bertha. And Bertha was a Frankish princess who was already a Christian. So huh. her influence may have had something to do with receiving these missionaries and also receiving them kindly. Mm. So eventually, Ethelbert does convert to Christianity. It takes, it takes him a while. Ultimately, he converts to Christianity. He continues to kind of support the missionaries and their establishment of a church and a monastery there as well. One of the things that I think is interesting that Bede talks about as this group gets founded, is it's pretty clear that from the beginning, England has its own kind of culture when it comes to Christianity and its own set of rituals. Again, from Bede, Augustine writing to Pope Gregory a number of questions. And so one of his questions is as follows. Where is the faith is one and the same? Why are there different customs in different churches? And why is one custom of masses observed in the Holy Roman Church and another in the Galatian churches? Huh. This here being the like the Gaelic church is not Galatia of the ah, okay. of the East. Yeah. And Gregory replies, You know, my brother, the customs of the Roman church in which you remember you were bred up. But it pleases me that if you have found anything either in the Roman or the Galatian or any other church that may be more acceptable to the Almighty God, you carefully make you carefully make choice and teach the church of the English which is as yet new in faith whatsoever you can gather from the several churches. For things are not to be loved for the sake of places, but places for the sake of good things. Hmm. Choose, therefore, from every church those things that are pious, religious, and upright. And when you have, as it were, made them up into one body, let the minds of the English be accustomed thereto. Wow, that is an interesting response. So that's a pretty flexible and open-handed response of, you know, again, there are Christians in England, in Britain before— Augustine shows up, they have clearly have their own culture and their own tradition, and the Pope basically gives license to say, hey, if this seems good and noble and pious, mm -hmm. keep it. Yeah. But there is also the sense of unity of, like, keep it, but, like, can we get all of England on the same page? So I think that's kind of an interesting push-pull. Well, and I love the, the intention behind Augustine's question is, is sort of this— what do I do? What do I do with this? Instead of just saying, no, this is the way, this is how the Holy Roman Church does it, so we must do it this way. There's this sort of grace to, to say, I'm not sure what's going on. And then the grace of the Pope, because he could have said, no, this is, this is how it is, and you're bringing it to them, so make it that way. There's so much in here that we have not seen from leadership before. Yeah, this especially compared to kind of where we've been talking in the last few episodes, this is a much more open-handed response. I also think this undergirding idea that you know, where the faith is one and the same, why are there different customs in different churches? If there is one faith, there should be unity of expression. I think that's one that a lot of people carry with them, and it's 
something we're kind of trying to break here in Church Historia really is to say where there is one faith, there is a multitude of yeah. expressions. And and again, those those threads that we like to talk about of that multiplicity kind of within the oneness mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So Augustine coming to Britain is the starting point of England becoming more and more Christian as time goes by. And women are really important in that development of Christianity as well. Some are, you know, directly evangelizing. We see some women establishing nunneries that mm -hmm. set up as centers of Christian learning. Marrying a Christian woman into kind of a pagan family is a kind of intentional thing that the church, I say the church does, but like that Christians will do to help bring Christianity into a family and into huh. a group of people. It's not just sort of the formal priests and bishops going forth. There's also a lot of everyday Christians doing this evangelism work hmm. as well. Something is a bit of a side note, but I think is worth saying is that with Christianity comes Latin. Okay. And Latin gives England this really sophisticated written language. They have a sophisticated language in their own right, but it's not ha as heavily emphasized on a written one. And so with this written language, England kind of really gets behind that. And so we get vernacular English, and we start to get the writing and transmission of Anglo-Saxon stories. Huh. So like, think Beowulf here. Also, England establishes a lot of schools and sets itself up as having some of the best schools in Europe. Bede is coming out of that tradition, who's probably one of the greatest historians of the medieval period. And Alcuin of York, who had mentioned under Charlemagne, who sets forth this education reform within the Carolingian dynasty mm -hmm. and empire is from England as well. So hmm. Christianity brings this Latin tradition, this emphasis on education, and it, particularly that written style of education, and then also gives us vernacular English yeah. as well. Okay. So some kind of fun side effects, if you will, yeah. of, of Christianity coming to Britain. So we're going to move slightly more west and hop over the Irish Sea to Ireland and talk a little bit about what Christianity looks like within Ireland. And we need to talk about St. Patrick. Then. The man himself. The man, the myth, and very much the legend. The legend. So Patrick is not the first missionary to Ireland, nor is he the first Christian in Ireland. In fact, when he goes to Ireland, he's going to the Christians of Ireland. So there's at least some of them there already. And it's likely that a gentleman named Palladius was sent by the Pope in 431 as the first missionary. But huh. Patrick is by far the, the most famous. There's a lot of really interesting things around Patrick and kind of the, the legend that builds around Patrick. He is simultaneously a very local saint, and there's a lot of a lot of places in Ireland that have a specific story about Patrick came and had a dream here or did a miracle here or cast mm. a demon out here. And he's both very local and then also very national at the same time. And there's very few other saints who bridge that simultaneous local and national identity. As a fun fact, I heard the other week that St. Patrick's Day is the most widely celebrated saint's day of any saint day in really? the world. Probably in part due to the Irish diaspora throughout mm. throughout the world and also the myth of St. Patrick and leprechauns, of course. Leprechauns. So Patrick, perhaps interestingly to people, is not Irish. He is... Hmm. British. We don't quite know where he was born. Might have been Scotland, might have been England, might have been Northern Wales. We don't know. In his confession, which he writes towards the end of his life, he refers to himself as a Roman and a Briton. Hmm. So he's definitely British. His father was a Christian deacon, and there's some evidence that that was more of a job for the tax incentives on, on doing that. Oh. So it doesn't appear that Patrick grew up in a particularly religious household, although he likely had exposure to the fundamental ideas of Christianity growing up. 
And at the age of 16, he was captured by a group of Irish raiders, and they took him to Ireland where he spent six years in captivity. Oh, so he didn't willingly go to Ireland. Not the first time. No. Oh, not the first time. Okay. So he worked largely as a as a shepherd during the six years and so spent a lot of time by himself and often his own. And this is where his conversion happened. I don't want to say necessarily there was a singular conversion experience, but he prays a lot. He starts to receive prophetic dreams from God. Ultimately, one of those prophetic dreams is how to escape. So he he does escape. He probably goes to France and then also back to Britain, but he spends some time being trained as a priest, growing theologically, and he eventually starts to have these dreams and feel this calling to go back to Ireland. So this mm. is this is an account of that dream. He said, I saw a man coming, as it were, from Ireland. His name was Victorious, and he carried many letters, and he gave one of them to me. I read the heading, The Voice of the Irish. As I began the letter, I imagined in that moment that I heard the voices of those very people who were near the woods of Foucault, which was beside the Western Sea. And they cried out as with one voice, we appeal to you, holy servant boy, to come and walk among us. Hmm. So he ultimately heeds this call and returns to Ireland with this missionary purpose to preach and convert and save the Irish. And so he, he does many things, does many miracles, goes many places, gets run off a lot, isn't universally accepted. So it's not like he comes and everybody goes, oh yes, St. Patrick, thank you for bringing us this great news. We are so excited. He runs into a lot of resistance, but he ordains a number of priests. He divides the country into dioceses. He founds a number of monasteries and just generally kind of exhorts the Christians of Ireland to a life of holiness and devotion. And then towards the end of his life, he retires, and that's where we get his confession. It seems likely that there were some charges brought up against him in Britain, oh. and he couldn't go in person to defend himself, so instead mm. he writes this treatise of his of his life, seeing as how we don't have clear history of what those accusations were. They probably got dropped. But ultimately, he dies in Ireland and is buried one of several places. I'm sorry, one of several places. Oh, yeah, they just, aren't sure where he's actually yes, buried. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation Not on, on where he's actually buried. His body is buried in several places. Correct, correct. <laughs> his, his body is all in one spot. Um, we're not sure where it is. Where this spot is, we're Got not it. sure. Okay. Um, so he dies in 461 around March 17th. Okay. So that's why that's the 17th why is, the... is St. Patrick's Day. Got it. And so this legacy that he starts just catches on and continues to grow and Christianity continues to spread and dominate throughout Ireland in the subsequent centuries. I did note he arrived in Ireland on March 25th, which is a significant day. Do you want to know why? Yes. It's the day that the ring is cast into Mordor. Well, I would suggest that Tolkien probably knew Well, and the about. reason why... It's a feast day. It's suspected to be the reason or the day that the day of the conception that the angel came to Mary, the, the day of humankind's falling. Oh, the I didn't realize we had a calendar date for the fall. You know, well done, church math. Indeed. So March twenty fifth is very important. Ah, very busy in day. Many ways. Yeah. So there you have it. So yeah, sounds like a great day for Patrick to surreptitiously uh, arrive in Ireland. Arrive in Ireland. Yes. So tell us why drinking and St. Patrick's Day go together. Right, because it's in the middle of Lent, which mm. one would think that a holiday that in which there is much imbibing of alcohol would typically not take place during Lent, but it does. So as the story goes, Patrick was on his travels, and there, there is a demon that has been trapped in the basement. And so oh. the woman who owns the tavern says, Patrick, will you come and, and expel this this demon? So he goes down to the basement. It's a demon on its own. It's just yep. this yep. demon spirit? Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Thing. Tell you that, tell you, yeah. It's not someone who has been taken Correct. over. Correct. It's not someone who's been taken over. It is a demon, demon in its own right. Okay. And so it's been trapped they in the somehow basement. somehow got it in the basement. Yep. And so Patrick goes down with the innkeeper and you know he looks at this demon and it is plump and healthy and striving. And he looks at it and says, this is because you are stingy and you're not generous. Because she also has a reputation of not filling your glass when you huh. order a drink and just kind of generally being sort of miserly and not generous. And so Patrick says, you know, I, I can't banish this, but if you want to do something about it, then you you need to be more generous. And so he goes off on his travels and eventually comes back around and comes back into the tavern and he sees that as they're pouring the pints, the pints are just overflowing now. And so he goes back down to the basement and the demon is shriveled and weak and he's able to banish it because the woman has reformed her ways and, and become generous and giving. And so in huh. celebration of that kind of miracle and that story of generosity, it is acceptable to drink alcohol during Lent on, on St. Patrick's, so Patrick's Day. So what's so interesting to me is that he is a real person who lived, and yet, like, this lore is made up. It's, that's just so interesting to me that these sorts of, like... This is not exclusive to the Irish, but the Irish are a storytelling mm -hmm. people, and they have a very, very rich storytelling culture and history, and they also don't start writing things down until they're encountering of Latin mm. being written down by primarily Christian monks. The Druids had a, like, religious reasons why they didn't write things down. So we don't get written records in and Ireland, And the Druids really. are? Kind of the, the main pagan group in okay. Ireland at the time. And so we don't really get written records until we get Christians writing huh. down these things. So when you, when you look at those sources, you kind of have to main, look at things both ways of when you're reading the more traditional stories and the more traditional folk tales, a lot of them have a kind of Christian bent to them mm -hmm. because you have Christian monks writing these stories. Conversely, when you have Christians writing about, say, St. Patrick or St. Bridget, they're writing from an understanding of this communal knowledge of the stories of the the folk traditions mm -hmm. and the pagan deities. And St. Bridget's a really interesting one because she gets called by a, a number of names, but her name derivation is also an ancient Celtic goddess. Oh. And so is she a person? Is she a goddess? Is she a person combined with this legend mm. of the goddess? Patrick does a lot of miracles that sound a lot like things that some of the great Fenian warriors did in in Irish lore of they do a lot of casting out of demons as well and banishing of things. So there's very much a, a dialogue between those traditions. And you know, even the the snake story with St. Patrick is probably not well, it's not real. And Ireland the was snakes, the snakes. So this right? idea that that Patrick banished all the snakes from Ireland. Okay. Ireland was snake free far before Patrick. It had kind of always been that way. But when Patrick was in France after his escape and before he came back to Ireland, legend has it he may have stayed at a monastery on an island. The monastery had a saint associated with it who had banished the snakes from that island. island. The monastery was on off the coast of France. Okay. And so that gets kind of transmuted Interesting. to Patrick in some ways, again, within this kind of Celtic tradition mm -hmm. of heroes who are banishing yeah. monsters and things. Yeah. So uh, it's a really kind of fascinating dialogue in the, in the nature of story and do stories have to be true to be true, you know, mm -hmm. factually accurate to be true. Mm -hmm. um, the person of Patrick did a lot, but I think the legend of Patrick has done even more. And the stories about him, whether factually true or not, had a power and a weight uh, yeah. to them. So... That's a little bit about Patrick. Um, I love that. So as this Christianity develops in Ireland, it takes on some uniquenesses that are unique, certainly from the continent and even from England. We'd mentioned before that Latin kind of stays as this scholarly 
language. Ireland is doing a lot of book copying. And, you know, this is the period of time where medieval Europe is rediscovering Aristotle and things like that. The Irish also get us, give us lowercase letters hmm. for the first time. Hmm. Um, it's coming from these, these monasteries as well. But the big thing is that Ireland doesn't have urban centers. It's not city-based. Mm. The pre-Christian Ireland, like, largely, like, chieftain-run kind of territories. But, again, there's no main city. So, in the continent, most of the ecclesial structure is around a bishop and a city and kind of going out from there. In Ireland, it becomes monasteries that then have influence out into the areas around oh. them. But rather than being through that sort of official ecclesial structure— we're coming through this other structure of the monastic movement and a monastic take on Christianity. So in particular, the Irish have a strongly ascetic and somewhat zealous style of monasticism. If you think of um, Skellig Michael, mm -hmm. um, these kind of craggy rocks and going and living out in the middle of the ocean and mm -hmm. being sub subject to the weather and, and all of that, that really influences this kind of Irish Celtic style of, of Christianity. Also interesting, at least in the early years, women played a fairly strong role in these matched to communities and having wisdom and getting to participate in leadership as well. So that set things apart a little bit there as well. But perhaps one of the, I don't say the biggest things, but the, the things that caused the most influence was this tendency of Irish monks to wander. And they... In general. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that has some roots of itself in, in Irish culture, of feeling called to go out in into the world. But we have a lot of Irish monks then going to the continent, going to Europe to sort of spread this Irish style of Christianity huh. as well. So right? it comes to them sort of through Patrick and then in a, I don't know, sort of drawing a circle here with my hands. bring it back to, from whence it came. Yep, and to England and to the continent. And so as they do this, it's not without controversy because, again, it has developed very differently than yeah. Christianity on the continent. And so one of the great examples of this is a debate over the date of Easter. And okay. when... When that should, in fact, be. This is the story of the Synod of Whitby, which is in England. It takes place around 663-664. And, again, we will turn to the Venerable Bede for... Thank you, O oh Great Venerable Bede. Yes. So he says, At this time, a great and frequently debated question arose about the observance of Easter. Those that came from Kent or Gaul affirming that the Scots celebrated Easter Sunday contrary to the custom of the universal church. So essentially there's a, like, Irish version, and then yeah. there's a, okay. a Roman version, Got essentially. Mm -hmm. So among them was a most zealous defender of the true Easter whose name was Ronan, a Scot by nation, but instructed in the rule of ecclesiastical truth in Gaul or Italy. Queen Einfeld and her followers also observed it, as she had seen it practiced in Kent, having with her a Kentish priest who followed the Catholic observance and whose name was Romanus. Thus it is said to have sometimes happened in those times that Easter was twice celebrated in one year, <laughs> and that when the king, having ended his fast, was keeping Easter, the queen and her followers were still fasting and celebrating the Palm Sunday. So this has to do a bit with, like, whether you're following a lunar calendar or a solar calendar and mm -hmm. how dates are falling. This question persists. There's sometimes two Easter's amongst the court. And finally, the king here is like, all right, we've got to figure this out. So Bede continues, the question being raised there concerning Easter and the tonsure and other ecclesiastical matters, it was arranged that a synod would be held in the monastery, the Bay of the Lighthouse, where Abbess Hilda, a woman devoted to the service of God, then ruled. Quick note, this is a double monastery, so there's a men's side and a women's side, Got and it's it ruled over by an abbess whose name is Hilda. Okay. So, good for her. Mm -hmm. The kings, both father and son, came thither, and the bishops, Coleman and his Scottish clerks, and Algebert with the priests Agatho and Wilfred. James and, Rom and Romulus were on their side, but the abbess Hilda and her followers were for the Scots, as was also the venerable bishop, and he acted in that council as a most careful interpreter for both parties. That's a lot of names. The point Lies. being, 
we have the kind of Catholic Roman tradition being represented. We have this Scots Gaelic tradition being held. We have somebody who's translating. So there's some linguistical things going on there. But the king um, sets things off saying that it behooved those who served one God to observe one rule of life. And as they all expected the same kingdom in heaven, so they ought not to differ in the celebration of the heavenly mysteries, but rather inquire which was the truer tradition that it might be followed by all in common. Again, this idea of if there is one faith, if there is one kingdom in heaven, if there is oneness, then there should be oneness in practice as well. Okay. So they have a lot of debate, and then the king concludes the council by saying, do you both agree in this without any controversy that these words were said ab above all to Peter and that the keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to him by our Lord? Quick note, the Roman position ultimately takes its cue from Peter. Peter, got it. So they both answer yes. Then the king concluded, and I also say unto you that he is the doorkeeper and I will not gainsay him, but I desire as far as I know and am able in all things to obey his law lest happily when I come to the gates of the kingdom of heaven, there should be none to open them, he being my adversary who's proven to have the keys. The king having said this, all who were seated there or standing by, both great and small, gave their assent, and renouncing the less perfect custom, hastened to conform to that which they had found to be better. Okay. So, ultimately, the tradition of Peter is given the higher authority. King is very poetic here about not wanting to have the keeper of the keys, Peter, not be there to open the gates when he My gets goodness. to heaven. But everybody agrees, and we now have conformity between the Celtic church and mm -hmm. the English church and the Roman church about the celebration of Easter. So again, as much as we said this tradition is a little bit different, we have a king calling a council to resolve church issue, he's presiding over it, he kind of lets the church positions sort of settle themselves out, but then sort of this great mediator moment. So I'm hearing you both say that you both agree that Peter is the <laughs> ultimate authority. And they say, uh -huh. yes. And he says, okay, well, Peter says this. So are we all good? And everybody's, yeah, we're all good. Some of the other influences that we see, especially as they get to the continent, is that they start seeking to reform a lot of things, and specifically reform monasticism on the continent. Because, again, the Irish monks are, are this very zealous, ascetic, hardcore form of monasticism. And continental monasticism at this point isn't really that as much. And so their dedication, their almost evangelism of this style of monasticism does prompt some reform within the mm. continental monasticism as well, again, reinforcing this idea of scholarly pursuit and scholarly dedication. It, for a long time, the Middle Ages has been kind of given the adage of the Dark Ages, and it yeah. just doesn't, scholars don't use that term anymore because it's not true. There's a ton of of scholarship and of reading and of study and, and rediscovery of Aristotle and ancient thinkers, and there's just a lot going on in, in this period, and the monastic movement as a whole plays a huge, a huge part in that. One of the other things that Irish monks sort of pioneer that then spreads on is a penial system where you go to a private confessor to confess your sin, and that person in turn gives you a specific penalty. And this is different mm. than what's happening everywhere else. Everywhere else, it's more of a general confession. This idea of confession has become an important one in Christianity because when Christianity starts and you're converting adults, you kind of have that big moment of confession of my life and then now your turning point. Well, when you're baptizing babies and that's your introduction to the, the community and the kind of reconciliation with the church as a child, well, you have a whole lifetime of guffaws and sin thereafter. <laughs> so there's this pastoral question of like, okay, but what is... What does confession and reconciliation look like now when mm -hmm. you're not converting as an adult, but you're right, right. being baptized as a child, being becoming part of the church at a really young age? So this style of private confession with a confessor who then gives you a specific penance to do gets really adopted on the continent and becomes 
part of the foundation of pastoral care and, and again that reconciliation okay. for the church it changes again a couple of centuries later but have the foundation threads here of how confession works today within the catholic right. church within this right within this style and then just to bring us full circle back to some of the conversation we had in episode four one of these irish monks who is zealously bringing Celtic Christianity to to the continent is St. Boniface, who brings Christianity to Germans east of the Rhine, but he eventually turns to the Franks and begins reforming their church, builds a really close relationship between the Franks and the papacy, and he's the one who anoints Pepin as king of the Franks. And we know about Pepin when Pepin, Pepin the becomes Short. king. So that petition that Pepin made to the Pope for support for his rule yeah. is implemented through the hands of Saint Boniface, who is an Irish monk huh. out wandering and bringing Christianity. Oh, to the that continent. is what a fun connection! So, cool. thanks so much for listening to this episode of Church Historia. We really appreciate you joining us on this journey. If you want more, you can always check on our website at churchhistoria.com where you can join our email list. And do be sure you subscribe to this show on your platform of choice so that you will always know when we have a new episode. And as always, if you enjoy what we do, we'd love it if you would share it with others as well. So if you like it, spread the word, tell your friends. We would be so grateful. Thanks so much. Thanks.